Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft declares war on Reply All. PepsiCo wants to sell you snacks directly online. And Charlotte Henry's here to help us understand the whole UK virus app mess. This is the Daily Tech News for May 11th, 2020. It's a Monday here in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, it's also Monday. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. As I mentioned, associate editor from the Mac Observer, Charlotte Henry is with us from the UK. Welcome, Charlotte. Good to have you back. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yes. Hello from Lockdown London. We were just talking about uh, what kind of live sports you can watch, given that most sports are canceled right now. Uh, that was on Good Day Internet, KBO, Belarusian soccer. Uh, get that conversation. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Spotify rolled out a beta of group sessions, which lets premium users share music controls with those nearby. A host generates a scannable Spotify code within the app, then provides guests with playback controls and the ability to edit and add songs to the song queue. So it's sort of like, we're all the DJ together. There's no listed limit on the number of users in a group session, and a session ends after an hour of inactivity. Twitter announced it'll add label to, to mark tweets with misleading information on COVID-19. The label will link to a Twitter curated page or an external trusted source to provide information about the misleading claims. Tweets will be ranked by on a propensity of harm scale with disputed claims or misleading information deemed moderate receiving the label, while those judged severe will receive a warning or removal. I can't wait for people to start arguing about how harmful a tweet was and what label it should have been given. Qualcomm announced, yeah, <laughs> Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon 768G system on a chip, its second 5G integrated chipset, and a higher clocked successor to its Snapdragon 765G with 15% faster CPU and GPU performance. The chipset also includes support for updates to GPU drivers through the Google Play Store and Bluetooth 5.2 with support for low energy audio. Google confirmed it's rolling out support for up to 32 participants on Google Duo video calls. That's up from 12. The beta version of the WhatsApp desktop app added a Facebook Messenger Rooms shortcut, letting up to 50 people join a virtual room there within the desktop app or the web version. Sony announced on May 10th that it temporarily closed the PlayStation Store in China to perform a system security upgrade. Now, the company didn't specify a reopening date or give much else detail, but it's unclear if the update is related to a recently disclosed backdoor that could allow Chinese PlayStation users to switch to overseas services and then download unlicensed games. Mount Sinai Hospital is working with Google to integrate Nest cameras into hundreds of COVID-19 patient rooms. Most rooms use two Nest cams, one to monitor and communicate with patients and the other to monitor the vitals. Live streamed video is sent to a purpose-built console at nurses stations. The solution was developed over several weeks to ensure HIPAA and other regulatory compliance with Google itself not having access to any of the data. Benefits include limiting frontline healthcare worker exposure, saving some time, and conserving personal protective equipment. Google plans to provide 10,000 Nest Cams with monitoring consoles to hospitals across the United States. DEF CON organizers announced that the annual Las Vegas conference that takes place in August is canceled this year. And yes, it's not a joke, it's really canceled due to uncertainty about the COVID-19 pandemic. Black Hat, which precedes DEF CON each year, is also canceled. Now, both will host online conferences instead, including research talks and social events. Founder Jeff Moss, aka The Dark Tangent, said in a forum post that the 28th DEF CON will be known as Safe Mode. Mm, I like that. Uh, and finally, for the 10 of you who really, really, really care, the subscription email app Newton Mail, part of the now defunct Accenture uh, was scheduled for a shutdown on April 30th, but the app has a new lease on life after being purchased by product designer Matrix Kataria and so friendly design agency founder Justin Mitchell. The two said they are fans of the app, will support all existing Newton Mail apps, and keep pricing at $50 a year. This marks the third ownership change for Newton Mail since 2018, and the new owners pledge that if the business fails again, they'll open source Newton and find a way for self hosted servers to support the product indefinitely. So, good news for the Newton users. All right, 
Let's talk a little bit more about chips being made in the United States. Yeah, maybe. The Wall Street Journal sources say that White House officials are in talks with Intel and TSMC to build chip foundries within the U.S. as well as with Samsung to expand contract manufacturing operations in the U.S. to more advanced silicon. A letter obtained by the Wall Street Journal from Intel CEO Bob Swan to the Department of Defense said that the company would be willing to build a commercial foundry in partnership with the Pentagon. Now, Intel currently has U.S. US-based foundries to create its own chips, but the proposed facilities would also serve third-party clients. TSMC has supposed supposedly been in talks with the U.S. government and Apple about a U.S. factory. Spokesperson for TSMC, Lil Coy, said that the company has no concrete plans, but that it's always open to building fabs overseas. Ah, they just didn't want to talk about it in public. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they're probably having talks, and there's just nothing to announce. Yeah. That makes sense. The other important thing to remember here is Intel does make chips in the United States. Uh, and, and so I'm sure if I were Intel's Bob Swan and the government came and said, hey, we'd like to give you some money to make more chips in the U.S., I'd be like, great, sign me up. I'll take some government money. Not a problem. Uh, this is not going to affect Foxconn, Wistron. It's not going to immediately change uh, where chips are manufactured for, for things, uh, but it could be, you know, a more direct supply line for, for chips to the Pentagon uh, for military uses. Uh, so, so there may be some validity to it. Uh, Charlotte, from outside the U.S., how does this strike you? Yeah, I think you're right. I think in general, uh, as we sort of move through the different phases of this pandemic as well, we're going to start to see a lot of products start to be manufactured in different places and supply chains perhaps become less dependent on China on or any individual location. I think we'll see that for all sorts of tech products. Um, we saw, you know, Apple did pretty well in its last earnings call, but a lot of that was for cert backed up by services and stuff that had been built before that, so that the supply chain from China wasn't particularly held up. Um, and so it makes sense that something as vital to these tech products as chips would, would be moved to different locations. That makes sense to me. And it, I, I noticed as well when Sarah was describing and talking about the different companies that this was going to apply to, a lot of them do make products of different kinds in the US already. You know, there are Apple manufacturing and development plants and all sorts of things in in. Uh, America already. So it's not such a huge leap for these companies. I don't well, think. and in particular, Intel already makes chips here. So right, it would exactly. just be making more chips here. So, you know, right. that's a, that's an easy one. Intel, that's Intel in particular, but a lot of the yeah. other companies, Sarah, Sarah named, do, do have production mm -hmm. facilities like of various kinds in, mm -hmm. in the yeah, it seems like it seems like a story that people jump on and go, "Ooh, look, the tide's turning. Things are really going to change." It's like, well, sure, there might be some expansion that can be done. Um, doesn't sound like anything is it inked, or if it is, we don't know about it yet. And yeah. this has already kind of been happening with certain companies, and it will take a long time anyway. Exactly. That's the thing to know about this is even if this does lead to something more significant down the road, it's it's going to be a while. This is not something that's going to happen right away. Intel and Microsoft released details on a new malware detection project called Stamina, uh, which stands for Static Malware as Image Network Analysis. That's got to be a backronym. Uh, this project takes a binary input file and converts it into a stream of raw pixel data with black or white pixels representing the binary values of one or zero. This one dimensional stream of pixels is then turned into a 2D image by assigning a width based on the overall pixel file size. And then that image, and this is the key part, if you're like, why would they do this? The image is then resized down to save computational resources and a pre-trained deep neural network trained on 2.2 million infected portable executable files scans the images and is able to achieve 99.07% accuracy in identifying and classifying malware. Uh, that's not that great really for practical purposes, but for demonstration purposes, it's quite impressive. Uh, there's a 2.58% false positive rate there as well. Microsoft said the system works best with smaller files. Uh, so you could limit it to just doing smaller files and potentially have an even better uh, performance rate. And then you've got something that could practically be put on a client because Microsoft's doing a lot of client side neural networks right now. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my initial question was, Okay, so the idea of converting it to some sort of an image format is how you're going to make it much smaller of a file that can then be um, 
you know, it you can run it through the process along with lots of other millions of small image files and figure out if there's an issue. I don't know, 99.07% isn't 100, but it is promising, at least That's in early tests. That's a lot, though, but yeah, yeah. No, it's it, like I said, it's, it's good for a demo. Probably you'd want higher, an enterprise certainly would want a, a higher percentage yeah. uh, in practice. I, I and and yeah, you you hit on it. One of the things is is performance because you can resize the image, so it's actually you can actually get through more than if you were looking at the raw files. Uh, and also, we already have deep neural networks trained on image recognition, uh, so you can use a lot of existing code to process this without having to rebuild it from scratch. I suspect the false positive rate is also going to put off enterprise at this stage. To you know, best part of two point six percent is far too high for a big enterprise network that needs to, you know, cannot be dealing with major malware outbreaks. That's far too high. And also because you can't disrupt a business for something that might not be a problem as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Microsoft's like, well, the smaller files, uh, we might be able to get it into an acceptable mm. range. Uh, and then, yeah, you're not you're not meant to be scanning all the possible files. You, you can separate it by MIME type and that sort of thing. Could, could be something there, though. And it's a really in, ingenious cool thing, <laughs> to, yeah. you know, uh, separate from, from what it could actually do. Something that also might be cool, depending on where you work or who you email with, Microsoft began rolling out a reply all protection feature for Office 365 and Exchange Online called Reply All Storm Protection. It's exactly <laughs> what it sounds like. Designed for larger organizations, the feature will detect 10 reply all emails to over 5,000 recipients within 60 minutes and be like, uh-oh, we've got a problem. Once triggered, users won't be able to reply all to the thread for four hours. They'll also receive a notification that the conversation is too busy with too many people. Then users will still be able to reply or forward to a smaller number of participants. They really have to, but it will make them think twice. I'm so here for this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, like, to be honest, as you're going through this story, I'm just having reply or PTSD. But I'm basically anything that makes reply all less horrendous for all involved, I'm very here for. I, yeah, so, I mean... That I agree with you, but it's how many five thousand recipient yes. reply alls have you yes. been on? I haven't been on any that are five thousand. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think I've ever no. gotten. That I've ever been on anything with that many folks. But even five hundred, that has happened. It yeah. gets it gets unwieldy pretty quickly. And the whole point, you know, with 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 the story is Microsoft is like this can like bring down operational servers. This can this can actually yeah. like really impact your day just because people are like, why am I on this thread? And then like a hundred other people do that at the same moment. Yeah, there's two different elements to that, isn't there? One is the keeping the show on the road and the other is just the horror of being in a <laughs> multi, you know, never ending reply all storm. And to end the the latter one, which in terms of kind of IT functionality is not that important. You probably would have to start limit this to uh, like five or 10 people even. But because this is obviously focused on enterprise, on big business, on making sure servers don't fall over, you can see why they've set the threshold quite high. And also you don't want it to be, you know, you're a startup having big conversations and you need to, all the staff need to be involved in this conversation. Suddenly you're blocked from doing that. Yeah. This is not going to stop Daryl from annoyingly replying to the daily update, uh, but it will keep your actual email system running uh, should 500 Daryls reply uh, oh, to, to the 5,000. Daryl means well. He just, he just is enthusiastic. I mean, yeah. Or he possibly is an energy vampire. One of the two. <laughs> uh, Eindhoven University of Technology researcher Bjorn Reutenberg uh, demonstrated something he calls Thunder Spy, a vulnerability on some Windows and Linux PCs made before 2019. Thunder Spy bypasses Thunderbolt's security levels feature or forces a Thunderbolt port to only use USB connectivity, which then allows direct memory access, which then can allow you to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, Thunder Spy does require physical access to the Thunderbolt controller. So this is not something that'll happen to you over the internet. Uh, usually what happens is, uh, the, you know, the, the scenario is usually you left your laptop in your hotel room, someone gets access to your room, removes your computer's backplate, uh, attaches an SPI programmer device, flashes your firmware to change the security state on Thunderbolt to none. That's the vulnerability, is that they can open up your computer, 
and flash new firmware to your Thunderbolt controller, and then you're vulnerable. Uh, then they would take previous Thunderbolt vulnerabilities and plug something into your Thunderbolt device and uh, hack your computer that way. The firmware update takes about two minutes. Uh, it would take another couple minutes to plug something in and do the hack and, and exfiltrate the data. And if you're me, about 30 minutes to actually unscrew stuff and screw it back in. But uh, probably professional spies are faster at that. Uh, Intel's kernel direct memory access protection does prevent this attack. But Reutenberg points out that that feature is not yet standard. Uh, in fact, it's not supported by devices made before 2019. And a lot of major OEMs, including he calls out Dell particularly, don't appear to offer it yet. So Intel saying this is fixed in our Intel kernel direct memory access protection. Uh, but if you're computer manufacturer doesn't support it, well, then there's a little he said, she said about what needs to be done. Uh, if you're confused and you're like, I don't know if I'm vulnerable to this and I need to find out because I'm a high value target, uh, go to thunderspy.io to check if your machine's Thunderbolt controller is vulnerable or whether you have the direct memory access protection. Uh, most of us, in fact, I was going to say all of us on this show don't need to worry about this. This is state level actor kind of stuff. And also it needs physical of physical access. So yeah. I think we're all okay for the moment. But Some, joking, somebody has to really target you, exactly. Yeah. So but joking aside, clearly the implications if some point before this is fixed fully you were hit with this, it's obviously very serious. As you say, it's kind of state level, high end stuff. But it's worth noting because there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not it applies to Macs and on Mac OS. And it's worth noting that I think Mac OS it doesn't work on, but it, if you're running boot camp, i.e. have a Windows partition on your device, then you are still vulnerable to the attack. Yeah, because the vulnerability comes through Windows. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Also, that, uh, that's my understanding. If you know, we've got mm -hmm. a story up at the macobserver.com if you want to know a bit more from my colleague Andrew, or he also links to the original paper if you're the person that wants to dig into that. But, um, it's not like it's one of those things where Mac users can go, ha, not our problem, because a boot camp partition does change things. I will add that uh, it is a great reason to encrypt your hard drive and, and or data or both. Uh, I, so, does that mitigate it, though? I'm not sure if it does. They can, they, can, they can pull data off, but if the data is encrypted, it's still encrypted. Uh, there are some Thunderbolt vulnerabilities that will allow them to to get into the machines uh, and bypass encryption. I think uh, I, I, w I would be I would be hesitant to say that encryption alone would would mitigate this attack. If I you, think if, I'm, I, I'm not I'm not okay. contradicting Roger's good advice of encrypt your drive, but <laughs> I would hesitate if you are a high value target to think encrypting your drive is all you needed to do. Uh, to protect this, because it is direct memory access, and I think there's ways to get at data, especially data in your memory, uh, that could be very valuable that wouldn't necessarily uh, be protected by drive encryption. PepsiCo, small company, uh, makers of Walker's oh, of potato that. crisps. Have you, Charlie? Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah they're, they've, uh, they're, you know, very indie. Launched websites at snacks.com and pantryshop.com to sell you PepsiCo food products directly online. If you're like, Pepsi, is not a drink? They sell a lot of different kinds of foods, snack foods. Snacks.com will feature more than 100 products from Frito-Lay. Pantryshop.com will feature bundles of items with themes like breakfast, family favorites, and exercise. Orders are expected to arrive within two business days. Yeah, what's the exercise? Well, it's something about like getting fit or, or well, it's probably or, it's probably like it's a workout slight, and recovery. A slight amount of caffeine. It's it's called workout and recovery. So it's muscle milk. Uh, and, I see protein stuff maybe. and protein bars and yeah. propel the you know. The, and listen, the, I you know replenish ha, your electrolytes. Ha ha, we laugh a little bit, but I mean. There are lots of snacks in the PepsiCo brand of products think, that I like oh, yeah, very much. Yeah. Uh, so. I think what's 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 uh, really fascinating about this is it put me in the mind of the fact that all of these makers of movies and TV shows have been coming out with their own streaming services because they look at the situation online and say, ah, a lot of people want to watch yeah. online. Let's cut out the middleman. Why do we need to pay a cable company? We can just give them the shows directly. And this is food companies noticing everyone buying food online right now and going, Hmm, maybe yeah. we could do that too and so just sell them all our brands. Do consumer people like that? Yeah, they like why are we making them go to the corner store that isn't open anyway to you know buy our products? 
Yeah, and it, one, Tom's right, it's kind of jumping the middleman. And also a lot of these companies who have some kind of food production or food distribution capability, which obviously in PepsiCo's case is huge, um, are adapting to help and provide different types of products for other people. Now, obviously, if you're PepsiCo, you don't need to worry about that getting, you know, I, I was telling you guys before the show, there's a cupcake company here in the UK that's also now delivering fruit and vegetables and those kind of things. But obviously, if you're PepsiCo, you have so much on your books, you don't need to worry about anyone else's stuff. You can just deliver, you know, distribute your products. And yeah, it's, you know, is it any different to the movie makers putting... So, you know, making their movies available to download Directly, now that yeah. there's no movie, movie mm -hmm. theaters open. It's not that it's no different. Yeah. And PepsiCo, you know, Frito-Lay. So all those those snacks, that's at snacks.com. And then at the pantry thing, you're talking about granola bars and granola and oatmeal and juice yeah. and you know common all pantry items yeah exactly yeah. hey folks if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com the world health organization plans to launch a covid19 system checking app later this month targeted at under resourced countries that app will I offer guidance about symptoms so uh helping you decide like is what i'm feeling possibly covid19 yeah. Uh, the WHO also plans to include a self-help guide for mental health care while you're in isolation. Also looking into a proximity tracing app. That they're not launching yet, but they are considering using Apple and Google's protocol. Uh, they say that legal and privacy considerations have prevented the WHO from committing to that feature, especially because the WHO wants to make one that's available worldwide, and you have so many different rules around that that they're trying to navigate. As we have seen on DTNS, we've talked about the different approaches in the United States, in France, in Germany, in Singapore, in Korea, uh, to tracing contact and how much technology plays into that and how apps play into that. Most recently on Friday, we mentioned that uh, the UK not only is testing a centralized contact tracing app on the Isle of Wight, uh, but also apparently, according to some reports, uh, has hired a company to create a decentralized app in case they want to change their mind, uh, which I think has a lot of people going, well, wait, what's going on in the UK? Are they going to do centralized? Are they doing decentralized? Why are they doing two? Uh, Charlotte, can you help us make any sense of this? <laughs> I, I will try. I will try. So, for, yeah, so first things first, you're right to say it was the, the Isle of Wight, which is, there were particular reasons the Isle of Wight was chosen. There aren't that many cases to start with. Obviously, it's an island in and of itself, so it's quite a kind of good test space that has, you know, enough people, but not so many people. It's, it, it kind of made sense to test it there. And I think my understanding is the take-up was slow, but has now apparently letters with instructions were sent to 80,000 households on the island. I think it's, I, I think I read that 55,000 of those people have now signed up to the app, which is pretty good because obviously the key thing about any of these contact tracing technologies is that kind of 60%, I think it's was it 80% of smartphone users, 60% of the general population pick up apps, need to use these apps, and that's what makes it effective. So you've got all that going on. That seems to have worked. People were critical of the approach the UK had taken. There was issues, for example, particularly on iPhone, whether if it was just two iPhones together after a certain period of time, would they, and if they were locked, would they stop talking to each other uh, using the you know, Bluetooth technology, Bluetooth handshakes? Uh, and there was some concern that there would, and it would need an Android device to kind of wake everybody up. Um, so th there's been a lot of debate about whether this version of the UK app was going to work. I think the government would say they need it to be centralised to make sure all the data is going into the right place and so on. Um, my understanding was Apple was continuing to advise the UK government even when it sort of drifted away from uh, the model that Apple Google had proposed. Um, but as you said, it kind of came out towards the end of last week that it looks like a second group of developers is working on a, a decentralized Apple Google model. Now, you could say, actually, this is rather sensible. Test, you know, you've got one test going because we need to remember there's a lot of talk about this Apple Google model, but it doesn't really exist yet. Mm -hmm. There's an API that has been seeded to some developers in a beta, uh, an iOS beta. That's basically where we're at now, right? 
Yeah. So if you want to start things rolling, doing a different way and kind of trying something else out first that may or may not work is not the worst approach to take. Yeah, in a perfect world, get together and figure out what's you know the right. best of both worlds. Right, so it's not the most disastrous decision and it's got a test going. And if it doesn't work, um, then you are allowing yourself the option to move to the second option. Now, this is what happened in Australia, as I understand it. They were operating on a centralised model, not dissimilar to what the UK is approaching. And they did have to run updates to make sure to move it more to the Google Apple model. So I think... So there's obviously going to be a shift. Germany flipped quite significantly before launching the app behind the kind of the, the big tech partnership, if you like. Yeah, it comes down to the centralized model is it is diff more difficult to protect privacy or at least to assure people that you're protecting privacy. With the decentralized model, you can just put the data on the device and say, it only leaves your device in very rare circumstances and right. we can define those very carefully. And there is no centralized server that you have to trust that someone is guarding and that no one's misusing because the data is on your phone. Uh, that's the benefit of decentralized, which is why Apple and Google hilariously came up with it because they're so hammered with privacy concerns constantly that they wanted to come up with something bulletproof on the privacy side. But it means that the data is a little more limited and it's, you, you can't do some of the more aggressive location tracking like what they did in Korea where they actually just went into GPS and said, yep. all right, let's just find out where people are and text message them directly uh, because folks are less comfortable with that uh, in Europe and the United States and certainly not comfortable having tech companies be the ones in charge of that, even though third-party advertising probably has more data than either one of these systems. Yeah, have. I mean, I, I think you know, we can make, I think the privacy, these like everything in this kind of, a grander policy response to COVID-19 that everything is a balance, right? Yeah. Well, and, you know, for a period of time, maybe we are going to have to accept some reduction in our internet privacy. But, you know, the fact that you're using Google Maps but don't want the Google, Apple or a COVID-19 contact tracing app kind of seems, which I've seen people say is kind yeah. of missing the point somewhat we know tech companies do have data now apple has always been pretty good at privacy and security google has got better they farm a lot of data but basically they want it for themselves they don't really want anyone else to have that data you know this is not facebook it's a very different kind of model right sure um and so i can and it was i can understand why those two companies came together i also totally understand the discomfort but you know we all need as a as a world, we kind of need to move forward. And this is not a bad solution. But uh, the UK response has been a bit muddled. We've had NHSX, which is the health services kind of digital transformation unit trying to lead on this. Um, and they clearly have now deployed a second set of developers. So it will be worth, I think they're waiting to see the results from the, from the Isle of Wight. And that will mm -hmm. be the most significant thing. One, have they been, has it worked? Has it, you know, have the conversations between devices been happening as they should? And two, are they getting the right kind of data in a secure fashion? And is there a take up as well? Those are going to be the yeah. things. And yeah, you can bring it, I guess you can then change the model and bring it in if necessary. Uh, and, and as we wrap this up, I, I just want to emphasize uh, all of this requires comprehensive testing availability so yeah. that you can test the people, the contacts, and find out uh, do they have it. Uh, and, of course, uh, manual contact tracing. This is not a replacement. Man this is a supplement at best. Uh, some epidemiologists argue that manual tracing alone is really all you need, and, and these apps may not be that helpful. That's another reason to, to test them and, and find out uh, how, how helpful they may or may not be. Well, if you want to be helpful, you can join in your peers in the conversation in our Discord, which you can link to by, you can join anyway, by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Byron in Los Angeles says, when Patrick, on Friday show, mentioned moving Tom's old DLP TV, I got a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for DLP technology, and as a matter of fact, I am still to this day using a Mitsubishi 60-inch DLP TV in our living room wow. that I bought way back in 2009. 
When I got the white dots of death years ago, Mitsubishi sent a tech out and replaced the DLP chip for free. And I'm only on my second bulb of this set's life. So major kudos to Mitsubishi for standing behind their product that's still going strong for 11 years. Of course, now that I've said that, it'll probably fail tomorrow. But such is the life of tech. (laughs) Sigh. (laughs) <laughs> thank you oh, byron. byron uh yeah. yeah you had better luck with your dlp mine got the white dot and, and it could not be revived uh and it and it uh it sat in cnet for a while before i finally found a place to recycle it at uh i did a video on how to try to resolder uh, a chip with it so i it's great to hear that that yours is still going that's amazing yeah, yeah. I know how it is to be like, it's old, but I love it. I just yeah. want it to keep working forever. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. You'll keep working forever. We're sure of it. Martin James, Bjorn Andre, and Tim Ashman. Also, thanks to Charlotte Henry. The beginning of a fun-filled week, I'm sure. Charlotte, where can people keep up with your work? Yes, yes, he's gonna we're gonna have a great week, Tim. Let's go in with positivity. I'm at obviously at the MacObserver.com every day and at Charlotte A. Henry on the Twitters if you want to say hi. And folks, uh, if you can, uh, and if you can't, it's fine, but if you can support us uh, and you want to make sure we keep doing uh, this kind of technology coverage for you, there's uh, a great way to do it directly. Cut out the middleman, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Uh, You can support us for as little as $2 a month. That's 10 cents an episode. And uh, get a few perks and extra bits of content along with it. That's dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. If you've got feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep it coming. We love to hear from you. Also, we're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Put it on your calendar. Join us and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. You have enjoyed this program. <laughs>